be muted as you probably should be. Cool, so people are coming in. Uh, so maybe we'll just give it a couple more seconds, maybe 10 to 30 seconds, and then we'll get going. How are you doing today, by the way? You can use the chat window to share your comments. And we'll be doing this quite a bit today. <laughs> it's great to see some familiar names on the list. And we have quite a number of people, so I think we're ready to go. Uh, once again, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, this is five steps to take neural machine translation quality under control. Uh, I'm Kirill Solovev. Uh, we'll be doing this webinar for you guys today and looking forward to share some of the insights that we have gathered and also to answer any of the questions you might have. So what will we cover today and how will this go? So first uh this is scheduled to run for about 45 minutes and then we'll open up for q a okay uh then who is this actually for uh it doesn't really matter that much if you're a translation buyer or if you are a translation vendor so i'll try my best to cater for both sides of our amazing industry today um I'm thinking that maybe you guys are just starting with deploying neural machine translation in your organizations, or maybe you have already made some progress, right? So uh, if you fall into one of those two categories, this will probably uh, give you the most learnings uh, and the most amount of insights. On the other hand, if you're an MT expert already, um, chances are you might know some of the best practices I'm sharing today, but please, I still encourage you to stay on board, listen to me, and then if you have any feedback on the thoughts and the concepts that we've shared today, I would love to discuss that after the webinar uh, with you. So please stay on board as well. Uh, what are the things that you guys are guaranteed to learn today, okay? Number one, uh, what neural machine translation engines are similar to? Number two, why biting your pencil like this is not going to be enough to fix your problems with neural MT. And number three, I promise to share today the worst kept secret about neural machine translation. Um, of course, you'll learn some useful insights on how to deal with empty quality changes, right? But most importantly, those three little things here. Now, before we go into the actual agenda, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit. I know I've met many of you over the years, and I'm very glad to see so many familiar names on the list tonight. I know that uh, you know some of you might have not heard uh, about myself yet. So my name is Kirill Soloviev. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Content Quo. Uh, we are a translation technology company headquartered in the north of Europe in beautiful Tallinn, Estonia. This is also where I'm based, by the way. Um, we'll talk about the company in just a second. I, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of things that I used to be doing. So I used to travel quite a bit uh, before 2020 hit. You can see some of the photos uh, here, mostly to attend conferences. You might have seen myself speaking at events like Block World or Gala or Taos, either, um, either being you know, on the stage or running webinars with those organizations. Uh, now, while I'm not doing localization, okay, and I, I have been doing localization for 18 years now, which is half of my life, to be honest, uh, I enjoy doing a couple of other things as well. I love digital photography, mostly black and white recently. If the weather is great outside, I love to take my bike for a spin. Fortunately, here in Estonia, it's only possible about four to five months per year, but that's okay. Uh, I love going to hackathons and over the course of just one weekend, building awesome technology solutions to difficult problems with very, very smart people. Uh, you've seen me on stage in different parts of the world. And I also love playing music. Uh, 
many instruments that I started to learn and never finished to learn to play. Uh, Irish traditional music is my particular favorite. And this little photo here, I'm actually playing the, the Irish flute and my uh, son is uh, hopefully enjoying the sounds I'm making. Uh, he's much older right now, by the way. He's four years old right now. His favorite instrument is the drum set. So have a little drummer in my family. Now, uh, I won't really go into the technology that we built uh, at Content Quo. We're not going to talk about software today. This is about best practices, but I wanted to do a brief introduction of the company. So uh, we were founded back in 2015 by myself. I'm the co-founder and my partner and, and CTO. And we both come from this industry. I come from the buyer side. He comes from the LSP side. And we realized that translation quality is probably one of the few unsolved problems. And we decided to attack it and we decided to solve it for good. Uh, we both fought with the challenges around quality during our careers. It's very hard to get it right. It's not objective enough. It's not transparent enough. So we set about building a company that will solve the challenges around translation quality for good. Uh, fast forward five years, we've been blessed to you know, be able to help some of the uh, largest and some of the smartest translation buyer organizations, commercial ones, government ones, and uh, some of the biggest LSPs in the world streamline their programs for uh, translation quality, both for human translation, but also for MT. And this is the reason I'm doing this webinar today. I wanted to uh, share some of the best practices we have picked up by working with those amazing machine translation teams, both on the buyer side, but also on the vendor side as well. Now, enough about myself. Let's talk about you guys. I know many of you, but I probably know about 50% at best or maybe even less. Can you just type in the chat right now what, whether you, the company you work for is an LSP or a buyer, how far along are you with MT? So doing nothing at all, just looking for now, starting to deploy, have been using MT for a while, or maybe you're an advanced user of MT. And if you still have you know, some uh, typing ability left uh, for, um, in you tonight, can you share the biggest pain that you guys are experiencing around your MT program or the biggest challenge you're trying to solve? And I'll give you some time to type it in. LSPs at the very start. Cool, thanks for coming. I hope this will be super useful for you. Quality department. Wow, that's awesome. Anybody else? So what type of company, buyer, LSP, or others? Uh, what stage? Uh, early, uh, mid-stage, or advanced? and the biggest pain that you guys are facing. Nice, keep it coming. So many things that you're sharing. This is awesome. I honestly can't even keep up with how fast you're typing those, but please, please keep, keep it going. I'm sure that you'll also uh, find other uh, similar people to talk to after the webinar and you can continue the conversations also uh, between yourself, right? And not just, uh, not just with me and not just with us. Not much pain yet. Wow, this is <laughs> completely fascinating. Um, I definitely would love to hear your feedback about this. MT solution in the future, looking to explore how to do this. Uh huh. Quality control of MT, choosing the best engine. Oh yes, we're definitely going to talk about choosing the best engine tonight. Stay tuned. Uh, oh wow. I cannot hear what you say, guys, but I almost can hear you, you in my head. This is, this is the next best thing that we could uh, do in place of a proper conversation. Right. Uh, thanks very much for sharing. Please keep it coming. Uh, I will start going about the agenda so that we actually are on time and that you still have time uh, to do more interesting and cool things tonight if it's evening for you here in Europe or maybe during the day if you're joining from Americas. So let's go. 
Um, when I was thinking about uh, how uh, to call the slide, what title to put on the slide, I thought about my son. Okay, he's four years old, as you might remember, and this is something that he might say when he plays. He would say, "Mommy, my neural machine translation is bad," and 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 he would expect you to fix it. By the way, now, note how he's not saying what exactly is wrong. Right, he is complaining about the problem, but he can't really articulate what exactly is happening here. Right, uh, we found out through our work was. Uh, some of the best LSPs and some of the best buyer organizations deploy MT that this is actually a very typical challenge with neural, believe it or not. So a couple of recurring themes that we've picked up, okay, when it comes to pains around machine translation. Um, pain number one, uh, it's hard to find the right MT engine for your needs. Just like in this photo uh, here, um, Judging by the letters, I think it's coming from, from Greece, right? I can definitely see the, the Greek alphabet. So uh, the same difficulty, right? Finding the right mailbox, where to put the email. I think uh, the world of machine translation these days is very, very similar. Just making up your mind where to start uh, can be uh, completely mind boggling. And we've seen this many, many, many times with different uh, companies that we talk to and that we work with. Um, we'll talk about some solutions about uh, for this specific challenge later on, so please stay tuned. So yeah, that's like the first thing that we've heard, just difficult to get started with MT and decide what first project would be the best fit or what MT engine would be the best fit and so on and so forth. Problem number two, once you get started with neural, what we've heard from our customers and from companies we talk to is that despite the recent advancements in the quality of machine translation output, neural can still be unstable and unpredictable. Um, just like this game of Jenga that I have the photo of here in the slide. In Jenga, you need to build this tower from those little wooden blocks. Uh, by the way, my son loves this game. He is awesome at it. He can build towers that are amazingly tall, but then uh, he makes just one little push, one little wrong movement, and the whole tower falls down and crashes into the ground. So we, we, we thought that MT is a little bit like that. So uh, something that has worked perfectly well for you yesterday and produced just the right quality for your needs, all of a sudden stops behaving in this manner today. Uh, and there actually there are, there are good reasons for why that might be happening. Um, so uh, we'll talk about some of those later on as well. So yeah, not being able to be sure that the NMT output you got yesterday will be of the same or similar quality tomorrow, right? And or having very high variations across language pairs, across subject matters, across domains. These are some of the other ways that this pain, uh, this problem with MT quality can manifest itself. Um, problem number three that we've seen and that those of you guys who have started to deploy MT uh, have definitely seen, right? Uh, MT quality, even neural, is still stuff that keeps your linguists awake at night. Uh, we've heard countless stories about pushback from the LSPs from the individual freelance translators when it comes to working with machine translation output. Again, despite all the recent advancements, just based on the previous two things uh, that we talked about, that it's difficult to find the right fit for, the, for your specific project and that it's unpredictable, apparently leads many linguists to, to have this, you know, uh, uh, this lack of affinity for working with machine translation output. Uh, and many problems, of course, later in this, you know, the process of post-editing MT come from those kind of fears and problems. Um, question to you guys. Uh, so we talked about the three things uh, that I've just summarized. Which of those three resonates the most with you? Which, which of those three problems is the biggest in, in your specific situation for you guys today? I know it's not exactly what you mentioned before, but I'm still curious. So just type number one, two, or three into chat and hit send so that I can see that. Two, two, uh-huh, unpredictability, says Juliet. Okay, 
So yeah, two was unpredictability, three is pushback from linguists, and one is just difficult to choose and difficult to get started. Uh, two and three, one and two, three, two, wow. Okay, lots of things. Uh, now, I know what you're thinking, and thanks for sharing your experiences, by the way. I know what you're thinking. This is also what I'm thinking right now. Uh, okay, we're talking about problems so much. Is there any way to actually solve uh, those type of challenges? And uh, I wish I could say that uh, I have a silver bullet for that, but I don't, okay? There's no silver bullets to solving the neural machine translation quality challenge. There's no one thing that you can do in order to make all of those challenges go away. But turns out there is a... Uh, like a train of thought or like a, a bit of a framework, even if you want, uh, that you can apply uh, in order to help you cope better with those types of neural machine translation quality challenges. And uh, we'll talk about specific applications and specific examples of how this mindset might help. But I wanted to introduce it first. And it's this. Now, this is not about biting your pencil. Remember, I promised to tell you about that in the beginning. If you just bite the pencil and stare at your poor quality machine translation output, no way this is going to make the problem go away. Instead, what I'm talking about is a very simple idea, actually. Your neural machine translation engines are actually taking the content in your source language and converting it to the target language or languages you're interested in. In that sense, they're remarkably similar to human translators or to your translation suppliers, to the linguists, right? Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, there are a ton of ways in which neural MT is completely different from a human translator. They don't get paid in the same way. They don't object to being corrected. They work much faster, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. But it turns out that if we ignore the differences, and focus rather on the similarities on how neural MT engines are similar to human translators, we actually get a very powerful tool. Uh, we can start applying vendor management practices to the wonderful world of machine translation. And vendor management in this industry has evolved over the last couple of decades quite significantly. And there's a number of steps that I wanted to borrow from vendor management and, and show you some examples of how those techniques, how those methods can be applied to take your neural machine translation under control. So uh, this is where the five steps are actually coming in. So some ideas, some best practices from content quotes customers on how you could tame neural machine translation with vendor management practices. Number one. And this is what I like calling the worst kept secret about neural machine translation quality. Uh, let me make an analogy with human translators first. Suppose you need to assign a linguist to a translation project, right? You want them to translate something for you. Now tell me this, would you ever be satisfied if you could only choose from one linguist for a particular translation job you have at hand? Probably not, right? This just doesn't make sense. Usually you would have a pool of suppliers that you would choose from, you would think about their skills, strengths and weaknesses, and decide who is the best fit to take on this translation job, right? <laughs> Guess what? Completely the same idea works perfectly well for choosing your neural machine translation engines. You need to have a larger pool to select from. Now, I wanted to introduce this company that's called Intento. I think somebody already mentioned it in the chat earlier today. So uh, Intento is a technology company that helps uh, organizations choose the best machine translation solutions and deploy them in the most cost-effective way. They've recently, uh, back in July this year, produced a report that's called the State of Neural Machine Translation. It was done uh, in collaboration with Taos, by the way. Uh, so in this report, there are a couple of things that I wanted to share that I know some people are just simply not aware of. Number one, there are over 30 different 
machine translation providers around the world. It's no longer about Google or Microsoft or DeepL only, right? <laughs> there are almost three dozen companies, each of them building thousands, if not more, individual neural machine translation engines that we can choose from. So in reality, the empty market landscape starts to become very similar to the human translator landscape. Even if it's an order of magnitude smaller still, it's still a huge choice. Now, next idea from Intento's research. If you really want to get the best quality from your neural MT, and you're an LSP, if you're a service provider, which usually means you have many different language pairs, many different content types, many different industries, right? So a huge mix. Uh, Intentof has found that you need to use at least seven, right, five plus two, seven different machine translation providers if you really want to get the best possible quality for each of your language pairs and each of the industries that you translate for. Seven providers, right? Many, many, many more individual engines, of course. Now, what if you are a buyer? Uh, and what if you are deploying an MT and you want to get the best possible quality? Then it's a little bit easier, simply because buyers tend to have maybe a slightly more limited language scope. Of course, this really depends on the company scale. I know we have some pretty big teams here today, uh, but usually also a smaller amount of industries, right? Mostly one or two, maybe a bit more content types than, than, than industries. Now, if you're in that situation, you need up to four different neural machine translation engine providers to work with. And in some cases, if you're really lucky, you can get it down to three or maybe to two, or in some extremely special situations, you can get away with just one neural MT vendor, but usually it's two to four. So uh, this is basically just the, the takeaway I wanted to, to share with everyone. If you really are focused on the quality of neural, make sure that you consider all the possible options, right, that you choose from a large enough pool, and there are many, many options out there in the market. Um, question to you guys, how many different MT providers you're currently using? Just add the number into the chat. If you're just using one MT vendor, like Google MT only, type one. If you use three different vendors, type three, and so on and so forth. One, four, great. Two, one. Working with Intento, yay, <laughs> that's a good choice. Uh, two, three, all right. Two, three, three, four, okay. Um, I know some of you guys here today are LSPs, right? So take note of this recommendation from Intento. If you have to optimize across a different set of languages, you might actually look at stepping up the game and increasing the amount of agency you use just to make sure that you really are increasing the odds for getting the best possible output for your language pairs and for your industries. All right. Step number two, to take your neural machine translation quality under control. Have your potential machine translation providers do translation tests. Would you ever be okay with letting a new translator work on translating your content if you have no idea how they can manage a task like that and you haven't actually tested them? I'm guessing this goes completely against the grain, even with all the flaws that we know about, you know, translation tests and how reliable they are. The absolute majority of companies we've seen prefer to test their translators or their translation vendors. Now, this, of course, also makes total sense for your neural empty engines. Uh, actually, this is another recommendation uh, from Intento. Uh, they have a very sophisticated way of using automatic quality metrics to, you know, help companies make the initial choice and lower down the amount of engines they're trying to consider. But they say it's crucial to have your human linguists work on assessing the output. Uh, and I wanted to introduce a fabulous example from one of our LSP customers. It's a, it's a medium-sized LSP headquartered in Spain. And uh, they were looking for a way to quickly test different machine translation engines 
out of the engines they work with and decide whether using MT on the project can actually give them savings because of the post editing process. And if it's a yes, if, it's, if an engine can actually save the effort of their linguists, they would be able to provide a lower price point in their quotation process to the client and thus potentially gaining more business for their company and still you know, making sure that the client is satisfied. Now, of course, if they find out during those tests that the engine is just not good enough, they cannot offer the post editing discount uh, to their clients and they, they would provide a different quote. It's all fair. They keep their margins protected. They keep the, the payments for their uh, vendors protected and then the client still gets a great result, maybe a slightly higher cost. Now, the challenge they had, of course, is doing this uh, quickly enough because a quotation usually you know has to be done within 24 hours or even less and that means they only had a couple of hours max maybe three maybe four to make that assessment of neural machine translation quality out of the engines they could work with and decide is it safe to offer a lower quotation to this client for this content they have been sending in or do they have to actually uh, offer the full rate because post editing is unlikely to be effective because the quality is so bad. Now, uh, I really love what we have been able to do together with them at Content Quo. So uh, automating their process so that they shorten the turnaround time from starting the evaluation uh, down to just a couple of hours so they could fit it into the quotation workflow and dish out those responses to their account management team very, very quickly. Uh, the method they have used in order to figure out if an engine is good enough or not good enough for this particular content from this client and this language pair is called adequacy fluency. Um, and I think what's fascinating specifically about this company is the journey they have passed uh, when trying to choose, by trying to converge on this particular method of empty quality evaluation. Uh, they tried, I think, at least four or five other different methods when searching for the right fit specifically for this context. And they settled on adequacy fluency as a result. So uh, the benefits it brings. A, it's actually fast to perform. It just doesn't require too much effort. And you can cover lots more volume with it. I think they have been looking at something like 1,000 word samples, maybe 1.5K samples to make those judgments. Or two, you don't need to train the linguists too much. It's easy to get started with this. And three, it still has enough predictive power to help you make the sort of important commercial decisions, just as in case of this LSP. Uh, so yeah, that's, that. uh, that's one way to do uh, tests on your machine translation providers. And of course, involving the linguists or the, the translation vendors into those tests is imperative if you later on want them to accept uh, the need to work with the output of this engine on this project. This is also another best practice that we have discovered. Question, uh, are you guys using adequacy fluency evaluations in your MT program today? Just type one if you do and type uh, zero if you don't. So one, if it's a yes, yes, we use AF. And zero, if no, we don't use AF, we use something else perhaps. <laughs> a two, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what does two mean, Yolanda? <laughs> ones and zeros, and ones and zeros. All right. It's a nice mix. Yeah, seriously, if you haven't tried adequacy fluency, take a look at that. Uh, like I said, it has many advantages. It's easy to learn, very intuitive for the linguist, represents the human perception of empty quality fairly well, and it's cheap, right? So you don't need to waste lots of budget in running those kind of evaluations. So it serves very well as the first layer of defense. After, you know, if you're doing automatic assessments and you're okay with the metrics you're getting, proceeding with something like adequacy fluency is a good idea. Step. Number three, to taking neural empty quality under control. Regularly evaluate your machine translation engine output. Again, drawing parallels was the world of vendor management. Uh, assume you have a number of translators or translation vendors working on your content 
for, I don't know, a quarter, uh, would you be okay with letting them continue if you have never ever checked on how well they're actually performing and how great their translations for your company really are? Uh, probably not, right? So you would probably want to check up on them in a regular fashion, maybe even give them feedback to help them translate better and so on and so forth. I know uh, we work a lot with vendor management teams too, by the way, not just empty teams. And we see some organizations are fantastic at setting up this regular cadence of evaluation. It does wonders for improving the quality of human translators. And guess what? It also applies to the world of machine translation engines as well. Um, I wanted to share this story from another content call customer. Uh, this time it's a big video games company. Um, and the team we work with is based in Germany. So they actually run their in-house machine translation program. Uh, and uh, they have lots of different engines, custom engines as well, uh, tailored to different games they produce and different genres, different content types as well. So quite a few of distinct engines in a bunch of language pairs. And of course they run regular training on uh, their engines. And they want to find out if after the training has been carried out, uh, the empty engine output quality has improved. This is what we all usually hope for, right? That we train the engines and it becomes better. Uh, maybe stayed flat, so didn't change. Or in the worst case scenario, even degraded, right? So we trained the engine, but something actually broke down and now it translates worse than what it used to. Uh, so that's exactly what they're trying to prevent or mitigate. So for this purpose, they actually run regular training sessions, of course, but also after the training, they run regular uh, human linguist evaluations of the trained engine. And they use information on trends and uh, compare the results of the engine pre-training with the post-training, right? Um, what I'm really excited about in, in, this, in this story, in this, um, and this success story is uh, how we were able to help those guys customize their approach to adequacy fluency. Because this is what they use, by the way, to keep track of how the engine has performed after the retraining. Uh, they had a, like a customized scale for evaluations. And in adequacy fluency, you usually evaluate things on a rating scale, right? One to four, one to five, zero to seven, whatever is your fancy. Uh, so we're able to tweak it precisely to their requirements, like how many points they have, what are the differences between those points, what's a one, what's a five, and so on and so forth. So helping them to seamlessly collect this data on a huge amount of language pairs across different engines so that they know exactly if something goes wrong after the training has been done, they know exactly when it happens. They have a chance to stop the rollout to production, go back and fix things and hopefully uh, make sure that it becomes better. Uh, now they also use uh, edit distance information after the engines have been running in production uh, for some time. That's another fascinating way to get insights about the quality of your neural MT, but we'll talk about that later on. Uh, I also wanted to share this idea, right? So this one was about custom engines. What if you guys are using baseline engines or stock engines? Uh, like. What I wanted to say is that don't think you're exempt from this process. It turns out that uh, companies like Google or Amazon or DeepL actually change the algorithms and, and get new data into their engines very, very frequently. Uh, so the output from the engine actually changes pretty much every day. Don't just take my word for that. Uh, look at the research that Nintendo has been doing. They actually monitor those changes from the major uh, engines and they know exactly how many times per month they change, when the best quality engine uh, moves from one vendor to another vendor. And believe me when I say the best engine changes on a monthly basis pretty much and smaller changes in the output can happen daily. And of course, Google and Amazon and Deepal are not going to tell us about every single change that they do. So the only way you can learn that your Google today is not the same Google that you used to have tomorrow, let's say in English to um, Norwegian um, manufacturing content. The only way you can find out if Google is still good enough today is actually checking the output from Google 
right? And doing this regularly enough so that you don't miss the spot where it's maybe time to switch to a different engine. So this practice, again, borrowed from the world of vendor management, completely invaluable to really stay in control, really see how you're training your forwards to, or just where the, the major engine vendors are going with their stock engines you guys might be using. Question. When was the last time, like how many days ago, let me put it this way, have you last retrained your engines? And if you didn't do any retraining in the past, I don't know, year, just type zero. But if you, you know, if you trained an engine yesterday, just type one. Uh, if it's been a month, just type, I don't know, 30, right? If it's been half a year, uh, type 180. Uh-huh, no relevant testing phase, right. 120, three months ago, all right. Anybody else training their engines or customizing the engines? Three months, uh-huh. Okay, this seems to be a bit of a norm, right? Unless we have, you know, real time adaptive MT engines that kind of can be trained in real time. This, this company that we work with in Content Quo, uh, they also do it on a quarterly basis and gather data on a quarterly basis and decide where to go from there. All right, cool. Let's go to step four. I'm taking neural machine translation quality under control. Collect post-editing data before and after post-editing your machine translation output. Uh, it seems very distant from human translators and from how the vendor management workflows usually go, but actually it's not that different. Uh, would you be okay with just letting your translator always run unattended without anybody looking at their work, improving their translation, and again, maybe giving them feedback? Probably most of you, you know, have some sort of a revision process or a quality evaluation process that you can use to improve translations, right? So you can actually get post editing data from human translations, okay? Just compare the version coming from the translation team with the version coming from the you know, revision team or review team or in country team, right? And you'll see exactly the post editing data. So same thing, of course, applies to taking control of neural empty quality. Let me tell you how we help this global top 20 language service provider based in France uh, make this process easier. Um, so we, we worked uh, with uh, the machine translation department in this case, uh, and their task is to train custom engines based on the needs of a production team. Uh, a new customer comes in, um, you know, they figure out they need a new engine translating from Chinese simplified to German, uh, I don't know, life sciences content. They shift this task to the MT department, and then the MT department is uh, having to train a customized engine that would work as well as possible, produce the best quality possible for this particular demand, right? So that's, that, that's what they're doing at scale. In fact, those guys have over 200 distinct MT engines across a bunch of language pairs. That's a lot. It's almost like a vendor pool they're managing there. And of course, they only want to ship the engine to production when the quality is good enough, right? So how do they find this out, whether it's good enough or not? Uh, again, the cool thing that I'm very proud of that we have been able to help them with on this project is implementing their metric, which I call internally predicted post-editing effort. Um, now, this is not actual post-editing. This is a pure evaluation exercise. So uh, what they do, they ask a linguist to look at the sample of empty output and rate each segment on a certain scale. Let's say five is the segment is flawless and does not need any changes. One is the segment is complete crap. I have to throw it out. I have to retranslate from scratch. N notice how this is different from the post editing exercise uh, and also from the quality evaluation exercise. It's a variation on adequacy fluency, technically speaking, but instead of asking the linguist to rate the quality, 
of the machine translation output, you are actually asking them to predict a completely different thing. What effort would it take me in order to get this piece of empty output to a decent quality level, right? So they're not thinking about whether it's good or bad, they're thinking about the effort they will have to make. Now, they also don't ask them to actually post edit the translation at that stage. So this is purely uh, an exercise in the mind of the linguist. This is actually faster than doing the actual post editing per se, which means cheaper as well for the company. For a large scale process like what they have, it's a decent compromise. It still has some predictive power. It still gives them an idea of whether the engine is good enough or not. And at the same time, uh, it allows them to reduce the, the cost they spent on this exercise. Now, uh, there's also, of course, a variation on that, right? So instead of asking people to think how much they would post edit, you can actually ask them to do what we call mock post editing, to give them a sample of MT, ask them to actually edit that. And uh, I know that some other customers of ours are also doing this in Content Quo. It's incredibly easy. Just bring in your raw MT output and then they post edit it and they get the post editing metrics, right? Like edit distance and so on and so forth, which are super useful, of course, for analyzing uh, the quality in detail. But of course, the drawback is it's slightly more expensive to do even more post editing on smaller scale than asking people to rate or predict the effort they will be making. Uh, speaking of which, this is remarkably similar to how automated, uh, modern automated approaches like quality estimation that you might have heard about before run, right? So they try to predict the post editing effort and uh, the, the process that this company is using is essentially like a manual version of quality estimation, getting useful baseline data without having to invest into the complex infrastructure to run this. Uh, new, useful, automatic evaluations, right? So uh, it's a great balancing act, of course, and I think they are doing it very, very well. Question to you guys, right? So um, I talked about this company that they have lots of different engines that they manage separately, about 200. How many engines do you guys manage? I'm curious, just type an approximate number if you can say off the top of your head. How many different MT engines do you manage right now in the program? So what's the size of your um, MT engine pool? 1,000, wow, that's crazy. I wonder what company you, you, you work for and what are the things that you do with those engines? That's a lot. 10, uh-huh. Four, okay. Must be highly specialized. Okay, anybody else? How many engines are you guys managing? It's okay not to say. All right, cool. Thanks for the input. Well, let's move to the last, but not the least step for taking neural machine translation quality under control. Investigate and analyze the errors or the mistakes that your neural machine translation is making. This one seems super obvious. Uh, again, coming from the world of vendor management, if a translator has done a particularly bad job, would you ever be okay with not looking in detail what exactly happened there and try to figure out how you could either help them improve and do better or maybe you know, find enough reason to stop working with that translation supplier altogether if you don't think that's something that can be addressed. So it's absolutely imperative that uh, there is a process in place in the MT program that allows you to figure out what exactly is going wrong in your MT output. So the steps we discussed before, uh, they serve to find or detect the moment in time when things start going wrong but you also have to figure out how exactly to fix it. And for this, I wanted to bring this example of another content call customer. It's a measurement and testing company based in the Netherlands. Uh, they don't have their in-house uh, machine translation team at all. Uh, so they actually outsource all the empty work 
uh, to one of their LSPs who is building the engines for them. So they're highly specialized in neural machine translation. So they run their program. Uh, so what this Netherlands company does in Content Quo actually is they do error annotation on the post edited output coming from their vendor. And they categorize the mistakes they can find, uh, whether it's about terminology, maybe style has gone wrong, or maybe you know there are technical problems in the output. And they kill two birds with one stone. One, they gather vital statistics on the quality of their post-edited machine translation. And two, they give their empty vendor very specific things that they should be fixing in the next round of training, right? For instance, if it's, uh, you know, if we're seeing lots of terminology errors, uh, maybe we could inject additional glossaries into our empty engine if we can. Uh, if it's about style, maybe we need to tweak the, the parameters of the empty engine itself to make it a bit more uh, fluent, perhaps. If it's about technical things like tagging, maybe we need to prep the files differently, right? Or maybe even change the engine if it cannot handle text, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, a useful variation on the error annotation process is, is what I call the, the white box approach. So the one before, the, the black box approach, you don't see how post-editing has been done. You assess the final output only. But the white box approach is when you can actually see the revisions that have been made during the post-editing process. This makes it incredibly easy to actually just do error annotation, categorize each change that the post-editor has made, and make useful insights, draw useful insights from the things that you find and use that to inform the next round of training. Super easy to do in Content Core, by the way. Uh, if you guys want to take it for a spin, just drop me a note later on. Now, um, we're kind of out of time here and I wanted to leave some room for Q&A and discussions and just exchanging more ideas of uh, you know, taking empty quality under control. I just wanted to share a couple of things where to go from here. Um, and I'll give you a few suggestions. Uh, tomorrow, after the webinar is over, and if you have signed up and if you're not watching this in the recording, you'll actually get a free uh, bonus from us. Uh, we've prepared a nice little comparative map of different methods that can be used to evaluate neural machine translation quality. So please check your mailbox tomorrow. With the recording of the webinar, we'll also send you this nice piece of content. Next week, so 9th of September, 2020, it's a Wednesday, uh, 20 minutes past one Central European time. Uh, mark the dates in your calendar. Uh, there is this online conference next week called Lock From Home 2, uh, organized by SmartCat. It's completely free, so please sign up straight away if you want. We are doing a panel discussion that's called Machine Translation Quality, Quantifying the Unquantifiable. Uh, I will be there, but so will be uh, two other amazing panelists, one of the largest uh, LSPs in the world and their lead for machine translation, and also one of the major e-commerce vendors of the world talking about their approach to empty quality. And we'll have an awesome moderator trying to help us all provide even more insights on the topic of quality for you guys. So looking forward to see you there sign up today. I already mentioned Intento State of MT report. You can get it from their blog on the website. You also get the slides for this, by the way, so you'll be able to click the link. Uh, Taos has an academy on their website and they have a section specifically dedicated to MT assessment methods. For instance, adequacy fluency is very well described there. So if you have never seen that before, take a look and there's more information in there as well that you can use uh, on a practical basis. And finally, eBay and their machine translation team has been doing awesome work in their blog, publishing in-depth information on how they run their MT quality program. They talk a lot about edit distance, about the data that can be collected, analysis, and so on and so forth. So if you haven't read their articles, I definitely suggest you do so. You'll learn much more about getting MT quality under control. Uh, last but not the least, of course, if you guys uh, feel you would benefit from a personal consultation, some of our expertise from helping the best LSPs and the best buyers in the world to streamline their neural MT operations, evaluations, get more insights 
about the quality of your raw machine translation or post-edited MT, uh, you're very welcome to book a call with us right now through our website. And I will guarantee I'll find 30 minutes of my time to sit down, discuss your specific situation with you and offer you the most relevant advice and suggestions that we might have from our extensive experience in the area. And with that, I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you very much. And please use the Q&A section or type them into the chats and I'll take them one by one. Questions or just, you know, thoughts or ideas that you wanted to share. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure to be doing uh, this for you today. I hope you learn new stuff, of course. Uh, if you have any thoughts to share, ideas to discuss, or questions you wanted to ask, you're all welcome. Aha! Uh -huh. The first question comes in. What about model front? So you might have noticed that we did not focus on the automated approaches to quality evaluation today. Uh, indeed, they try to predict uh, what probably is at a distance. Uh, and this is definitely a novel thing that is something you would be smart to consider including in your machine translation program. Uh, I've actually talked multiple times to Adam, uh, who is their uh, CEO. And uh, one thing that we share with him is this. Uh, if you want to run machine translation programs at scale, you cannot get away with just one type of evaluations or one type of metrics. You absolutely need different things working in unison. So there is room in every MT program for automated metrics, including quality estimation, like what Modelfront is offering. That's probably one of the best ways, by the way, to start with quality estimation without building it from scratch, uh, including human evaluations on a holistic level, like adequacy fluency or A-B testing approaches and whatnot. And of course, human evaluations on an analytical level, uh, like error annotation approaches I briefly touched upon today. So all three have to be present in order for you to have ultimate control. Sorry, we cannot cover everything today, but you will see all of them mentioned in the comparative map that you guys will get tomorrow in your email. It's definitely cheap, but it also doesn't just provide enough uh, predictive power in order to base your most important MT decisions on. For instance, if you were selecting an MT vendor or set of vendors to work on, I would definitely advise not relying on automatic metrics. So there's room for everything. All right, uh, I'll answer some more questions. Uh, this one is from uh, Alona. Uh, evaluation is done on a sample. What would be the best size of a sample? Uh, great question. Uh, it depends on the methods you're using. Um, there are some recommendations, let's say for adequacy fluency uh, on choosing several hundred segments usually in order to make the right impression. I would actually advise you to check out the uh, TAOS guidelines on adequacy fluency. They, they have uh, recorded the specific numbers in there, but I also know from our experience that the um, recommendations that work in an academic setting or maybe in case when you have lots of time and unlimited budget are sometimes hard to squeeze in for LSPs. So we're also seeing companies compromise smaller samples, less linguists doing the same evaluation and so on and so forth. So I think we can be pretty flexible on this one. You need to do this on time at the right time on regular intervals. That's the most important and get some data that will help you make better decisions. Uh, all right, uh, next question. Uh, from Juliet. Uh, Juliet is saying, you need expert linguists for good NMT as it can appear very fluent. And if so, if the linguist is not expert in the source language, might miss things. I completely agree. Uh, I think that's one of the major reasons why companies are investing more into scrutinizing the quality of neural MT output, because on the surface level, it has become so good that it's so easy to miss mistakes. This is when we need those in-depth evaluation techniques to really get hold of what's going on there and see past the, the highly fluent facade of the quality. Unfortunately, this is just one of the quality aspects and there are many, many more to take into account. Okay, uh, next one. 
how do you quantify MTPE productivity gained versus standard human translation and review? How do you decide on a percentage saving or gain? A great question. A couple of approaches we've seen from our customers that work well. One is the mock post editing thing, right? So you grab a piece of empty output, you do a uh, like a fake post editing round on that, you keep track of the edit distance. Uh, you can also try and keep track of the um, time spent on the mock post editing. By the way, this is a feature coming to Content Quo later this year. So we'll also do not just uh, edit distance metrics, but um, time tracking as well. So you can use one or the other, or ideally both together to do a small post editing round and then use that information to inform larger scale MTP productivity gains and agree on this percentage with your linguist, right? Ideally, the same linguist does it or the same vendor does it in the mock exercise. This gives you much more negotiation power. Uh, next one. Uh, again, question from, uh, question from Steve. Is it advisable to call up several different empty engines within a project, for example, at the segment level? Steve, absolutely, yes. You might remember the first step that we talked about in taking control is choosing from more engines. This applies at all stages, of course, both when you're trying to solve an enterprise MT deployment, but also when you're trying to resource a project uh, specifically on the LSP level and even on the individual linguist level. I know that uh, MemSource has already been doing that on a real-time basis. Uh, I think Intento is offering similar functionality as well. So dynamic switching between the engines to give you the best fit on the segment level. This is still advanced territory. We honestly don't see many companies who are already doing this today, but this is an interesting direction, right? Always a balancing act, how much control you give to the linguist in choosing the engine or to an algorithm versus making this decision, let's say in a more static way. Uh, I think we're slowly moving to be more dynamic, but still based on human judgment, on human input, both pre-project and post-project at the same time, and combining the different data points to decide even better. Uh, cool, next question. Uh, ah, I flipped the slides. Yes, thank you is definitely due. Uh, and another one from Juliet. Uh, another thing that is important, the quality of the source content which is frequently written by non-mother tongue English and can be hard to understand. Juliet, you absolutely nailed it. Of course, source quality has tremendous impact on the quality of translation, and this is completely not specific to MT. Uh, I've just been talking to a company uh, who's actually interested to run source content quality evaluations and content quo, and I'm really looking forward to the point where we can actually start working with them and see how that goes. Uh, it would be great to see whether the effort that we make upstream in preparing the source content can be quantified in the in less effort that is done downstream on MT, post-editing, or maybe even improving the raw translation if that's an option. So definitely lots of initiatives going on. I've heard from our government customers as well that they're working on simplifying the source language and potentially, you know, trying to get that under control as well, and then pairing it up with MT. Uh, so hopefully sometime soon, even us ourselves here at Content Core, we might be able to share some results around that. Any more questions, guys? Uh, we're pretty much at the end of our time here. Uh, it was really awesome to talk to you today, but we maybe have room for one more. Any more questions, any more thoughts that you guys wanted to share? All right then, thank you very much. You've been an awesome audience today. I really appreciated all the questions. So please look forward to an email from us tomorrow with a recording and with a bonus map. And like I said, stop by our website, uh, book a call with me, it's completely free, no application. I would love to talk about your MT program in more detail and offer specialized and uh, tailored advice and suggestions for your particular situation. Looking forward to hear from you soon and have a great evening or a great day. Bye-bye.